generous introduction. The, the problem with these generous introductions, of course, is for the speaker then to live up to them. And um, I have singularly uh, failed to do so, <laughs> so far, and I probably will tonight as well. So do bear with me and be charitable. Uh, it's good to be uh, with the Iona Institute and now this time with Skelling. What does Skelling mean, uh, Professor? <laughs> uh, well, I'm interested to know what it means. Um, uh, so it's, it's very good to be, uh, to be back here. I think it was about 10 years ago, almost uh, exactly, since I was last with you, David. Uh, thank you for inviting me again. It's always good to be invited again because it means um, you haven't entirely uh, uh, been a, a, a disaster. Well, uh, we've got quite a lot to uh, talk about uh, tonight uh, in terms of David's brief to me. I'm not sure if I'll get through everything, but uh, let's see. Uh, I wanted to start uh, with good news. You know, I mean, there's a lot of bad news, but let's start with the good news. So, as I uh, go around different parts of the world, I find that there are actually traditions of tolerance uh, of difference, uh, a particularly difference of, uh, in belief, in, in many different cultures, in their history, uh, in their background. So uh, here, first of all, is this cylinder of Cyrus. Cyrus uh, is actually mentioned in the Bible, in uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, but when he became uh, emperor and replaced the Babylonian empire, one of the things he did uh, was to promulgate a decree which is recorded on the cylinder, um, allowing uh, many of those who were in exile during the Babylonian empire to go back to their homeland, including of course the people of Israel. So they were able to return and to rebuild the temple and so on. And that, as you know, is, is also recorded uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. I happened to be in Tehran when the cylinder of Cyprus had been loaned, uh, of Cyrus had been loaned by the British Museum to the National Museum in Tehran. And um, I um, was uh, in a meeting of dialogue uh, with some Iranian political and religious figures. And I said to them how wonderful it was that this cylinder was in Tehran at this time, and what a great tradition of tolerance of the Iranian people uh, it exemplified. And the man who was chairing on the opposite side said to me, he said, well, uh, we are not interested in the past. We are only interested in the future. And I regretted that sentiment very much because uh, unless we understand our past, it is very difficult for us to plan for the future. So any nation wanting to forget the past uh, is actually doing something um, not very wise, let's put it like that. Um, then, uh, just to go on from the cylinder of Cyrus, this is back in the British Museum by the way now. Uh, Ashoka uh, was a great uh, military uh, ruler in, in India about, uh, so the, Cyrus's dates would be about uh, in the 6th century BC, this is a couple of centuries later, uh, he conquered many parts of India, unified the country and so on, but he was then converted to Buddhism. Uh, and gave up his sort of military exploits and became uh, a pacifist and promulgated decrees of religious freedom for his subjects of any faith uh, which were recorded on these pillars which are still standing. Um, now I say this because uh, of course in the West people think that Buddhism is a very uh, peaceful religion and uh, in many cases it is. But uh, we also know that in countries like Myanmar uh, and even in Sri Lanka, uh, Buddhist nationalism has been responsible for persecuting people of other faiths, including Christians. We can come back to that. Uh, so the question to ask again uh, of those uh, who admire Ashoka and his Buddhism is why 
uh, his commitment to religious freedom can't take place today in countries where Buddhists uh, are a majority. Then, uh, this is Constantine. This is, by the way, not the Edict of Milan. People reading Greek will know that's the Nicene Creed. Uh, but um, the, the point about uh, Constantine, of course, is his promulgation of the Edict of Milan, which emancipated the church. I mean, most people know that. Uh, ended the, the great persecution of the church in the Roman Empire. But it wasn't just about that. It was actually a promulgation of religious freedom for everybody. That has to be, uh, to be remembered. And um, again, uh, it gives us a basis in tradition uh, about why we should care for religious freedom, uh, where we have a voice. Uh, by the way, uh, only a few years historic, in historical terms after the Edict of Milan, the other great superpower of th that time, which was the Persian Empire, also promulgated an edict called the Edict of Yazdegerd, which also um, recognized religious freedom, particularly for the Christian communities in the Persian Empire that had been greatly persecuted uh, before, uh, and created a system of self-governance for them that lasted many hundreds of years, and was actually imitated later on by the Ottomans uh, to accommodate religious diversity in the Ottoman Empire. Um, the recently deposed um, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, whom I knew as a cricketer, uh, of course it's uh, not always a qualification to be Prime Minister, uh, but some people think it is. Um, he declared when he became Prime Minister that he would make Pakistan a state like that of Medina. Now this is the so-called constitution of Medina that was promulgated by the Prophet of Islam uh, to accommodate uh, Jews, pagan Arabs and Muslims and also some Christians in Medina at the time uh, and it allowed uh, for a certain amount of equality uh, among these different communities. Uh, anyone wanting to model themselves on this um, in the Islamic world um, is welcome to do so. I mean, when people say to me, which they sometimes do when I'm in those parts, that they want to have an Islamic state, uh, and many countries are nowadays called the Islamic Republic of whatever, and I say to them, will it be like the first Islamic state? Uh, and if not, why not? Of course, uh, uh, this situation did not last very long in Medina. I think one has to be honest and say that. And there was a, a terrible persecution, particularly of the Jewish tribes in and around Medina. Uh, that is not my topic for tonight, but I think in, in all honesty it has to be, to be mentioned. So again, there is a tradition of tolerance there, uh, and can it be used? Uh, King Alfred in the United Kingdom uh, the first sort of unifier of law in England anyway, uh, and he made sure that the different customs of the different peoples uh, making up his kingdom of Essex, uh, that their customs were incorporated in the laws that he was making, uh, provided that they agreed with the Bible and the teaching of the church. I mean, that was the proviso. Uh, out of that came a, something called the Charter of Liberties with St. Anselm, uh, then Archbishop of Canterbury, compelled Henry I uh, to promulge uh, as a condition for his coronation. He wouldn't crown him otherwise. Well, that's, that's something worth thinking about. Um, and that eventually resulted, resulted in Magna Carta, uh, Magna Carta was written by Archbishop Langton, probably because he was the only one among the barons who could write. Mm. Uh, but he then held Rochester Castle. I mean, I lived opposite Rochester Castle for 15 years. And I used to think about this against King John, who wanted to get rid of Magna Carta. And if Langton had not held Rochester Castle for that 
time, you would not have had the tradition of liberty that arose from Magna Carta. Now, um, the, the background, of course, um, to Magna Carta and other such instruments is the idea of personhood uh, that came uh, into prominence because of the Christian faith. There is no, no question about it. There's a very fine book by a man called uh, Larry Siedentop, who is an academic in Oxford, uh, called The Invention of the Individual, isn't it, David, I think, uh, uh, in which he lays the blame for Western ideas about personhood squarely uh, on St. Paul. Because he says, before the Christian preaching uh, began, religion was either familial, the religion of the heart, or it was tribal, or clannish, if you like, or it was imperial. It was Christianity that introduced this idea that religion has to do something with our relationship, or a person's relationship with God. Of course, the canon law of the church, uh, later on, which uh, actually uh, had an influence uh, over uh, considerable parts of a person's life, in terms of marriage, children, uh, personal law, as it were, also uh, had this, uh, promoted this idea of personhood and of personal rights and obligations. Um, this, uh, all of this is captured and encapsulated in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which reflect a cumulative, basically Christian tradition about the relationship of person to society and of a person's obligations to society and of society's obligations to the person. Well, we can be grateful for all of that. The problem is that uh, in spite of these traditions of tolerance, we are living in an age where there is a great deal of persecution, of uh, particularly for our purposes, of religious groups. Sometimes they're minorities, sometimes they're not. Um, and the question is, why is this the case? Why is there so much persecution? And uh, there is no single answer. There, are, there is a number uh, of uh, responses that one could make. These are Christians in Eritrea. The persecution began with the evangelical Christians in, in Eritrea uh, by the tyrant uh, ruler. It then spread to the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Patriarch simply disappeared. Uh, and then it uh, spread to the Roman Catholics in Eritrea. Uh, so that shows that if there is persecution of one group, even if it's not our group, we should be concerned because it can then spread to us. So, you know, if today it's happening to us, uh, to, to them, tomorrow it might happen to us. And that is definitely... Now the reason for persecution here is just simple old-fashioned tyranny. Uh, that's all. And there, there are many such examples of uh, tyranny being the reason for persecution of religious believers of one kind or another. Then, Christians in China, uh, still a great deal of uh, persecution, although the numbers of Christians in China, as you know, has uh, grown exponentially. Um, if you want to read about this exponential growth, read a very fine book by a journalist uh, from Time magazine um, uh, called Aitken. I think he's called David Aitken, but I'm not sure of the first name. It's called Jesus in Beijing. Uh, possibly a hundred million plus Christians now in China uh, and on target uh, for China to become the country with the largest number of Christians. Quite incredible. Uh, but this is accompanied by the demolition of churches, the exile of pastors and priests, the imprisonment of bishops, and uh, even today, even in spite of the Vatican's um, agreement with China, there are still Catholic bishops who have spent most of their episcopate under house arrest. I mean, uh, Michael Kinsella is here, I'm sure he will, he will know uh, the details about that. Uh, and whether um, that agreement was was wise in any case with uh, 
with a regime like China. But the, the point about this is that this cause of persecution is ideological. It has to do with a particular uh, Marxist inspired ideology which is now also becoming nationalist with uh, Xi Jinping's program of civil salvation. Uh, and Christians are seen not to fit into this in spite of the very long history uh, that the Catholic Church particularly, uh, but also the Church of the East, the so-called Nestorian Church, has had in China. Um, other kinds of nationalism, this is uh, uh, Hindu Twa. Uh, the inspiration for this is the it's a fascist idea, really, that uh, to be Indian is to be Hindu. Uh, and uh, you will know, what was the symbol of the National Socialists in Germany? Yeah, well, why, you know, that's not an accident. I mean, the swastika is an Aryan Hindu symbol. And Hindu nationalist ideology is inspired by the same kind of idea about um, uh, nationalism that inspired um, what happened earlier. That, that is why it's so dangerous. And the people behind it are openly, openly fascist, the Shiv Sena, for instance, or the RSS, uh, and they have very close links, I'm sorry to say, with the present government in India. And so the persecution of Muslims or Christians uh, has increased very, very sharply uh, in, that, uh, in that place. Uh, yeah, um, extremism in the Holy Land, the patriarchs uh, of the different churches in the Holy Land issued a, a letter recently, I think it was just before Easter, uh, saying that Christians were suffering from extremism from both sides. extremists on the Jewish side and the extremists on the, on the Muslim side. Um, and this um, brings me to the uh, to something I uh, want to give some attention to, which is uh, the rise of extremism in the Islamic world. A uh, close friend of mine, um, I've known him since he was a schoolboy, uh, who's now an MP, Muslim MP in, in England. His name is Rahman Chishti. And he has said that 80% of the persecution of Christians takes place in the Islamic world. I'm not saying it, he said it. But I think it's true. Uh, and the question is uh, why this is the case. So, uh, there's been a great resurgence in Islam in the last 50 years, let's say. Some of that's been good. Uh, some of it has to do with an awareness of their history, of their traditions, of their customs, a revival uh, of learning and um, uh, of literature and so on. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's very good. But a lot of it has been what you might call explicitly, avowedly, backward looking. By that I mean looking back to the 7th century and attempting to construct political and social systems that resemble as closely as possible that period. And that is, uh, that is what has caused suffering. Uh, the agenda for much of this uh, backward looking resurgence um, has to do with the restoration of the Khalifa, the, the Caliphate, which was abolished in the wake of the uh, First World War uh, by the Allied powers. Uh, but ever since then, Sunni Muslims have sought its restoration, and this is a major item of agenda. The restoration, so this is not just Islamic State. I mean, they, they did it in their way, but this is actually something that is deeply embedded and is part of the agenda uh, of many extremist uh, 
movements, whether they are violent or not. Um, secondly, the program to restore the Sharia in its original form, or allegedly original form. Uh, and that means every aspect of life in an Islamic state is governed by the Sharia, uh, including the treatment of non-Muslims, of women, uh, of relationships between non-Muslims and Muslims, or women and men, and, and so on. Uh, and this has uh, brought about in many places a constriction, a restriction of the freedoms uh, of people who are not Muslim, but sometimes even of Muslims, particularly women. Uh, I can give you uh, many examples. I mean, Iran is an obvious example of this. Uh, in Pakistan, when I was working there, we uh, cooperated with largely Muslim women's movements who were combating the attempt to restrict their opportunities uh, on the basis uh, that Sharia did not allow certain educational or employment opportunities um, for them. Um, there is then um, the um, what is known as the Dimma, which is to say to return non-Muslims to being permitted uh, or tolerated minorities in an Islamic system, but not as citizens. So to take away some of their fundamental rights, but allow them to exist with very reduced rights like the freedom to worship, but not freedom uh, to share their faith or publicly to profess their faith uh, or whatever, or even to have Christian symbols displayed publicly. Um, the father was saying earlier how this church had originally been built in such a way that it didn't look like a church. Well, there are plenty of such examples in the Muslim world today. Um, people are allowed to build churches on the uh, condition that they don't look like churches. You might think it's a strange thing, but that, that's how it is. So, uh, the Sharia and the Dimma, uh, and um, then the, um, and of course everything that flows from it, uh, but then the whole business about apostasy, rida, and sub, as it is known, blasphemy, uh, this has been a dead hand on freedom of expression in the Islamic world, for Muslims as well as uh, for non-Muslims, for Christians. Um, and has caused immense suffering. You will know famous cases like that of Asya Bibi, who spent nine years in, in death row, uh, accused of a blasphemy she had not committed. And there are many, I mean, she is one, one example, but I could give you scores of such examples. Um, it results in violence against minorities in the most extreme cases. Uh, this is uh, on the one hand, Our Lady of Salvation Church that was bombed during Mass. And that is the ancient city of Malula, where Aramaic is still, the language of Jesus is still the, the lingua franca. In fact, uh, they asked me to say the Lord's Prayer in, in Aramaic when I was there to, uh, 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 where there had been, a, there was a desecrated altar, very ancient altar, desecrated by extremists. And when I said the Lord's Prayer, the mayor then got up and he said, uh, Bishop, we, uh, I will now say the Lord's Prayer in the way we say it. <laughs> so, it was a very gentle way of correcting my pronunciation. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, we, um, these are ex recent examples uh, of what has happened. Um, some uh, Islamic organizations are saying, uh, that they have renounced violence. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan and Muslimin say that, and I believe them. But then, uh, if they have renounced violence, who is responsible for the violence in Egypt, of burning churches, of priests' houses, of pastors' residences, and so on? Uh, I am very glad, uh, whatever else you may say of President Sisi, that uh, 
For the first time, in certainly my memory, Egyptian Christians are now allowed to build churches, and they are being they are being built. They are being appointed to public office. He's just appointed a Christian chief justice in Egypt. I mean, this is unthinkable. What would have been unthinkable some years ago. Um, so, yeah, if they have renounced violence, that's good, but we need to, to know uh, whether that is, uh, that's a real renunciation. Uh, the Tablighi Jamaat uh, is uh, a fundamentalist organization. When I was a bishop of Raiwind in Pakistan, before I was bishop of Rochester, uh, Raiwind is really not known for anything, except that it is the headquarters of the Tablighi Jamaat. And every year they had a missionary convention. Now you've got to listen to this. Every year they had a missionary convention of Muslim missionaries throughout the world. How many do you think they got to the convention? Have a guess. How many? Thousands. A thousand? Twenty thousand? Yeah, this is like an auction, isn't it? <laughs> At that time it was eight hundred thousand. Uh, people there today tell me it's now gone up to a million. So it's a huge organization, even in Britain, I, I don't know if they exist here, they probably do. Um, and they are non-violent. Uh, when they say they're non-violent, I believe them. But the question is, if non-violent uh, extremist ideas can then lead some people to violence. Not all, but some. Uh, and I think the evidence is that this can happen. Um, democracy is a great thing, uh, but what is the test of democracy? Is it taking power through the ballot box or is it giving up power? through the ballot box. Uh, bishop Kenneth Cragg was a very distinguished Anglican bishop, a teacher of mine. He died just short of a hundred, still writing away. Uh, and a great, very sympathetic student of Islam. And somebody said to him once, a journalist I think it was, uh, Bishop, you're such a sympathetic student of Islam, uh, but in the end, what's the difference? And he thought about it and he said, in the end, the difference is the attitude to power. So, Christ, Christianity teaches that you change the world by giving up power. That's the message of the cross, isn't it? Islam teaches you change the world by taking power. Now that's not going to change. I mean, that's nothing to do with extremism either. Um, so the question is, if you get power through the ballot box, as the Muslim Brotherhood did, for example, in Egypt, what grounds are there then in their own thinking for giving it up? You see, and the jury is out on that, quite frankly. So democracy is not enough anywhere actually, uh, because democracy can become a tyranny of the majority. That's no less a tyranny, because it's a tyranny of the majority. This is why at different stages in history, uh, bills of rights have become necessary. Uh, the progressive, the Bill of Rights of 1689, the progressive repeal of the Test Acts in Britain, uh, Catholic Emancipation, I was just reading about it, um, uh, eventually removed the disabilities that people had suffered by the will of the majority. Um, the incorporation of the amendments to the American Constitution, which function as a Bill of Rights. Uh, and um, in Egypt, when the uh, Brotherhood were in power, I was arguing for a Bill of Rights there. Um, some of that has been incorporated into the new Egyptian Constitution, but not, not everything. It's, it's only a beginning. And it needs to develop. Now, um, that's the situation in the, in the Islamic world and why things are happening there. I will also ask to say something uh, about the secular West. When I began my work with Oxtrad uh, about 
helping uh, persecuted churches develop their leadership, I thought that my work would be in Egypt and Pakistan and Iran and Iraq and Syria and Nigeria, northern Nigeria and so on, and it has been. But then people in Britain started asking me, what are you going to do about what's happening here? People are losing their jobs because of their beliefs. Uh, they are being excluded from public life, like sitting on magistrates' benches because of their beliefs. There are certain professions they can't enter, for example, if they, if they uh, refuse uh, to take any part in the procedure for abortion uh, uh, or with IVF or a whole number of other, other things. Uh, what are you going to do about that? So I very reluctantly got in, involved in this. Um, and I began to see what the reasons were, uh, just as there are reasons in the Islamic world, so there are reasons in the West. Um, the first uh, thing that struck me was that many of the values uh, that the secular West uh, promotes are sort of pale shadows of Judeo-Christian values that have been taught by the church for two millennia. But they're pale shadows, they're not the real thing. Uh, and not only are they pale shadows, but the secular West holds them without having any grounds for holding them. You see, what? if you say, well, why do you, why do you believe, for instance, in um, inalienable human dignity? Uh, the answer is, I mean, an, an atheist said to me, he said, it's because I believe in man. So I said, well, you're going to be very disappointed, mate, if you do that, because uh, I'd rather believe in God. Um, so, um, there's no grounding. There are freestanding values, and like, this, um, like the Cheshire cat, um, the cats disappear, the smile also will eventually disappear. It's the aftermath of a Judeo-Christian culture. Uh, but also, these values are mutated. So, inalienable dignity of human beings, all human beings, has become autonomy, radical autonomy. So, things are justified. For example, the whole argument about assisted um, suicide uh, is human autonomy. The Christian understanding of personhood is that of relationship, not only with God, but with family, with friends, with society. Uh, but human autonomy is radical individualism. You see, so the Christian idea has changed into this. Liberty, uh, well, that's the equality first. Um, I was once invited to speak to the Equality Commission. And I said to my secretary, um, you know, are you sure they want me? I'm not the sort of person that um, <laughs> so she checked, she said, no, no, it is you. So anyway, I went and uh, uh, wonderful people all beavering away at equality, uh, but with no idea why human beings should be equal, you see. I mean, why do we believe human beings to be equal? Um, on the face of it, they're not equal. You know, they're rich and poor, they're physically able or not, uh, they're intellectually differently gifted and so on. So face of it, they're not equal one. And the, of course the answer is that human beings uh, are regarded as equal because the Bible teaches that they have a common origin. A common origin created in God's image. And so much flows from that, of course. Um, this idea of the equality of persons created in God's image has mutated into the equality of all kinds of lifestyles and uh, preferences uh, uh, for living and so forth. Uh, so that is what they were, they were working at. A, a lot of what they were doing had nothing to do with the equality of persons, but the equality of people living in certain kinds of ways. And of course there is no end to this. Uh, the more you include, the more there will be to include. So, uh, take one example, um, LGBTIQ, what has it got to now in the alphabet? Uh, I mean, you know, we 
run out of the alphabet. We won't run out of preferences. Um, so <clears throat> that's when you mutated liberty. Um, the idea that people should not be coerced. Um, Pope Benedict was once asked about this. He, uh, the journalist, hostile journalist, said, um, "Your Holiness, for hundreds of years, the Roman Catholic Church has been teaching uh, that error has no rights. Uh, it is now promoting uh, religious freedom. Why? Is, how did that happen?" And he said, "He said, in this we've gone back to the earliest form of the tradition." Journalist said, Well, what's that? He said, The teaching of Jesus. Uh, so I thought it was a very good answer. I mean, that uh, Jesus never coerced anybody. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a long tradition, particularly the Dominican tradition. I don't know if there are any Dominicans here, but the Dominican tradition, uh, going back to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, uh, but expressed, exquisitely expressed in the work of Bartholomew Las Casas, the bishop in Mexico on the fundamental rights of the Indian people, called Indian people, they weren't Indian of course, uh, because Columbus thought he'd got to India, but he'd gone the other way, um, of the, of the so-called Indian people uh, were sacrosanct because they were made in God's image and they could not be compelled to become Catholics. I mean that's a Catholic bishop saying this, you know, in the 16th century. And this idea of religious uh, liberty of fundamental freedoms of human rights was debated in the University of Salamanca in Europe and that is how it got into human rights discourse in Europe. If you read John Locke, he reads like the Dominicans at Salamanca. Uh, and, you know, really, uh, so-called enlightenment um, scholars won't uh, admit this, but it can't just be a coincidence. I mean, the main blank of John Locke's argument about human rights is that people are made in God's image. So um, um, that uh, the idea about liberty has uh, mutated into libertarianism, that is the indifference about what happens in society. Um, Simon Jenkins, um, Sir Simon Jenkins, as he is now, uh, I worked with him on a public committee once. And I mean, he's a libertarian. His basic uh, view is that everything should be allowed to happen. And I had many battles with him because he had no idea of what restraints are necessary to ensure uh, that uh, the, the basics of society are respected. And that brings me to the other, the, the last great thing, which is safety from harm. Now, this is, of course, a Christian idea uh, that uh, people should not be made to fight the games in the Roman um, stadia uh, and uh, people have certain basic rights to safety which have to be uh, respected. Uh, but it's become uh, individualized. So, safety from harm means safety from harm of the individual, not of the basic uh, institutions of society. But without safety from harm of the basic institutions of society, there can be no guarantee of safety from harm of the individual, particularly when the individual cannot defend himself or herself, when they are too weak, whether that is at the earlier stages of life or the later stages of life, or if they happen to be in a coma, the withdrawal of hydration and nutrition at certain periods, I mean all of these, how are, you, how are you going to defend that if the institutions themselves have been corrupted? So I, I began to see that these were the reasons that have led to the attack on the person, of the Christian understanding of personhood, of family. I mean why has there been this incredible attack? on the basic unit of society, which is the family. I mean, all the research shows, for example, that children relate differently to mothers and to fathers. Children play differently with their fathers than they do with their mothers. Uh, they learn differently from each parent. So in, in the strict sense, there is no such thing as parenting. 
there is mothering and there is fathering. And yet we are now being sold this idea that it doesn't make any difference. Uh, all kinds of research uh, purporting to show uh, that children have no kind of biological relationship with their parents and that they surrogates of various kinds can be made to fulfill uh, fathering and mothering function. Well, we know this is a big lie, uh, but uh, this is uh, one of the reasons for the attack on Christian conscience. Um, Christian conscience, uh, consent of the person, uh, these again have arisen uh, because of uh, Christian ideas about personhood. And once you dispense with those ideas, then conscience will no longer be respected. So in Britain, I mean, it's probably very similar here, but in Britain there was a long tradition of respect for conscience. Even in times of war, I mean, I know many people uh, who refuse to uh, serve in the army uh, or the armed forces in the Second World War. They were given other jobs to do. But their conscience was respected. Even the Abortion Act of 1967 in Britain respected conscience for those people who, because of their religious beliefs or whatever, or their beliefs generally, uh, could not take part in any procedures leading to abortion or uh, with abortion taking place. But uh, recent legislation on, for example, so-called equality legislation takes no account of conscience. And again and again it has been denied. When an appeal has been made on conscience, it, the courts have not upheld it. Uh, this is a very dangerous development uh, because it will once again restrict religious liberty. Um, I mean, I know about a hundred cases where people's freedom of conscience, of belief, of expression of belief, of taking part in worship, uh, I mean, gender-related abortion, well, this was, act, there was proof that doctors were providing gender-related abortion in Britain. And the, um, um, the public prosecutors refused to act in the public interest, they said. Well, what public interest is being served by refusing to act against such a practice. So, um, <clears throat> the other um, idea, which is, of course, uh, in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, but actually has American origins uh, in, their, uh, in their Bill of Rights, in the amendments to the Constitution and in uh, civil rights legislation is reasonable accommodation. That an employer, private or public, has an obligation to accommodate the religious beliefs of the employee if that does not damage um, the, the particular trade or service that the organization is offering. And it is widely applied in the US. Um, but in Britain, it is widely ignored by employers and by courts who have to decide whether employers need to provide for religious accommodation. I mean, it may be that you have cases here, <clears throat> uh, but respect for well-formed conscience and religious accommodation are two key issues in making sure that Christians continue to have freedoms uh, in the secular West. Uh, I'm sure this is, uh, this is happening here in Ireland as well. It's certainly the case uh, in Britain um, and every opportunity should be taken to test uh, whether these freedoms do exist. Now, finally, I was asked uh, why does the West today uh, ignore religious persecution, particularly of Christians, in many parts of the world? And there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, one reason is what I call imperial guilt. There is a sort of rather misplaced sense that somehow Christianity has, has to do with the imperial past of various Western powers. 
Uh, well, it's true that sometimes uh, Christian missionaries of various kinds cooperated with the imperial powers. But it's also true that very often they resisted them. So on questions of forced labor, for instance, or slavery, or even access to Christian missions. So the East India Company famously uh, would not permit Christian mission in its territories until it was forced to do so by Wilberforce and others by an act of parliament. Uh, so this is a kind of misplaced uh, sense of, of guilt. Secondly, there is what they, the diplomats, this is diplomatic language, at least British diplomatic language, called religion-blind approaches to relief and development. This means that in making funds available or engaging in development or relief projects, no account is, can be taken of the religious beliefs of the people who are benefited. Well, that may be okay sometimes, but when you know that the Yazidis and the Christians in Iraq are being persecuted because they are Yazidis or Christians, this is a very foolish kind of belief. And uh, many such examples can, can be multiplied, um, whether of Christians or of other people. Uh, then there is religious illiteracy uh, in the political and diplomatic elite. Uh, and this uh, religious illiteracy, uh, maybe there's a different word for it, it means that people think that religion is not an important factor in giving account of events that occur. Uh, so they will, even in the face of evidence, they will still try to give a political or economic account of what is happening, or social account, rather than to see religion as a factor, good or bad. So, uh, for instance, the rise of extremism in the Islamic world is often attributed to social alienation or economic deprivation and so on, rather than religious ideas which are being transmitted. Um, and it, it's very deeply embedded. And then, um, finally, there is a failure of nerve in raising issues having to do with freedom of religion and belief because they are regarded as, as too difficult. Uh, I was uh, part of a, a, of a small committee advising the Foreign Office in, uh, in the UK on freedom of religion and belief and there was huge resistance from the diplomats even to take this on board as, as agenda for diplomatic missions. Um, and all sorts of evasions were, were presented by they shouldn't take it on board. And I'm sure that many of them still haven't. So I think those are some of the reasons why these matters uh, are not taken up, uh, are not seen as important, as uh, crucially important. And of course the end result is that uh, religious communities of different kinds, including Christians, uh, then suffer because the West is not being involved in advocacy, uh, in relief, in development of the very people who need it most. Well, thank you very much indeed for your patience and I, I look forward to the pushback.